Hey, everybody, and welcome to this panel discussion about CMMC 2.0. At what point do we stop calling things 2.0? But anyway, welcome to 2.0. Um, so as, as folks know, uh, uh, you know, DOD came up with CMMC and then just changed it. And funny story is Mike Hamilton uh, and, and I were just presenting to a group of people what, like a little more than a week ago mm -hmm. about the importance of CMMC. And as soon as we finished, the alert came out that CMMC was going away and it wasn't really an alert. It was like this little it was a thing news article. They just, they, yeah, that they barely even put on their website. So, um, you know, as more information has come out about what CMMC 2.0 is, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions from our customers. There have been a lot of questions, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, all over the place about it. Uh, and so we wanted to get folks together today to talk about, you know, what CMMC 2.0, how it's changing. Um, and to do that, um, we're going to talk about, well, who we are. Uh, we're going to talk about the facts, and then we're going to do Q and A. Now, if you haven't been to one of our panel discussions before, they go a lot better and a lot more interesting the more questions you put in the chat. Uh, and one of the things I love doing is interrupting these fellows to ask the questions that you have. So put them in the chat. We'll interrupt them. We'll get your questions answered uh, uh, during this time. Uh, we'll go about forty-five minutes today, uh, and we really appreciate you being here. So, oh, and by the way, the chat's over on the right where it says chat. If sometimes it doesn't pop up for you, hit chat, and then uh, and then you can type in your questions, and I'll type something in there in a second. Um, so Mike Hamilton is Critical Insight founder, former CISO of the City of Seattle. Fred Langston uh, is the other founder of Critical Insight, and he's the head of consulting and really has led up everything we've done uh, on CMMC, helping companies aim towards compliance for that. Uh, and my name's Jake Milstein. I'm the event host. Um, and with that, um, Mike, you want to talk about uh, what you know? Yeah, the atomic weight of chlorine is 35.453 grams per mole. Uh, well, oh, that, no. that'll, help, that'll, help, you know, that'll help the DOD a lot. So. Yeah, go to the next slide. Let's just talk about a few headlines here. Um, so uh, these are all fairly recent. So DOD revamps controversial CMMC program. We'll dig in a little later on here in, in what made it controversial, why it's controversial, has to do with how it started and the organizing committee, what's called the accreditation body. And the DOD is saying, okay, well, now that this has been evaluated, what happened was they started it and they said, okay, time to do this thing. Everybody has to get compliant with a certain level of maturity, depending on what kind of bid um, uh, you're, you're going to submit for different kinds of opportunities. And it had to do with control, non-classified information, whether or not you house slash handle that on behalf of the DOD. Well, it w underwent a... Uh, I believe it was congressional and DOD uh, review. And when they finished their review, they said, no, 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 we're going to change this. And so what has to still occur is they have to go through the rulemaking process and embody this in process for all of their procurements, et cetera, et cetera. Probably have a big contractor management database that uh, talks about everybody's level of compliance, things like that. And they're talking about two years for that, right? Because government. Um, and then the, 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 so the AB, the CMMC accreditation body, well, first there was this gigantic surge of these organizations that wanted to get accredited as what's called a C3PAO, uh, Cybersecurity Private Sector um, Assessment Organization, or maybe it's just Private Assessment Organization. So was, those are the third parties that would audit against the CMMC specifications and determine whether or not you were really at a level that you wanted to be or if you had other gaps to close and things like that. And the way that this organization funded itself was uh, by charging fees to the organizations that they accredited to perform the certifications. And the phone just quit ringing. Uh, and that's all stopped. And all of these organizations out there that are now accredited, and, and we know a number of them, uh, we intentionally did not do that. Um, you know, they're kind of holding the bag going, okay, well, that really didn't make a lot of sense for us to do that. Um, it'll be back. Um, but here's the, uh, the Homeland Security CISO talking about concerns over CMMC changes. 
you know, one of those is, hey, are all of our vendors, you know, going to be demonstrably at a security standard that we want? Because now we won't know. We're going to go back to our spreadsheet questionnaires, I guess. Um, but the other one is this, and Fred will talk about this a little bit. On, 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 on the 2.0 new lowest level, you can self-assess. And no, nobody that is trying to manage third-party risk likes this self-assessment business. It's much better if it's done through a third party or if there's some real structured process you go through exclusive of, here's my god-awful spreadsheet full of questions, fill this out. Self-assessments are always aspirational, always. And so that's the concern with Homeland Security. So, you know, I won't say that this is, you know, a mess. Uh, but it's gone through a lot of changes in a short period of time. At its core, I believe that this is a very good way to do this because it uses a market force, the power of the purse to get security. On the other hand, it created an unfunded mandate for a lot of smaller companies that absolutely could not pay for this kind of thing. It is super expensive to get, a credit, to, to get certified by one of these accreditation organizations um, these C3PAOs, and for smaller companies, they may be doing something where they handle this controlled unclassified information, but just can't pay to get this thing done. So it, you know, created a, a blew a bit of a hole in defense contracting, and everybody was really worried about it for a while. And I think right now, just to cut to the chase here, I think a lot of companies can go, you know, and take a step back. Whereas this thing was bearing down on them real hard, you know, I think it created some some breathing space and some time to consider exactly how this is going to go. Fred, I'm going to let right. you talk about all these words. Okay, so I'm going to try to run through a whole bunch of factoids. Um, I will say that it's actually relatively simple when you boil it down to what eventually we got to. So. Um, you know, like Mike said, you know, they may get the rulemaking done in nine months. They gave themselves up to 24 months. I don't think anybody's fooling themselves and thinking they're going to get it done any quicker than 24 months. So we've got that long before we'll even know what really what this is going to be. Now, they've they've alluded to what it's going to be and what it, the structure will be. And I, I don't doubt that they'll stick to that. But there's always going to be some nuance that is going to come along with the rulemaking that none of us can predict right now. So, you know, we also know that once the rulemaking is done, then there is probably another potentially two year period in which they're going to give people the time to get ready and, you know, become self assessed and be able to uh, attest to that fact and prove that to them uh, by, you know, uploading their attestation to the supplier portal. Um, so that's another two years out before maybe even the last of us, if you will, will have to actually have our stuff uploaded in the portal attesting to our compliance. What has kind of changed in terms of, you know, one versus two, level one or version one versus version two? Five levels in version one. Um, three was the target level for most companies. If you only had federal contract information, FCI, you actually then could probably be a level one or level two. But in the new version, there's just going to be three levels. Level five and four were probably going to be rolled into what is now level three. Uh, level two will be the old level three. And one and two will be rolled into the new level one. So uh, really, most people that we've talked to have always been targeting level three because they do have controlled unclassified information at least in some part of their business so those former you know formerly trying to get to level three now should be targeting level two okay so that's just a simple shift in numbering but the the one change that has happened is level two um, has 21 less the controls than the version one, level three, meaning it's a slightly less burden now in CMMC version two at level two than the equivalent at the, the previous version. So there were 21 extra controls before that you don't have to worry about now. 
Another thing that is very significant, and this is where that rulemaking will be critical and where we don't have answers yet, um, you can now have a non-empty, or mean, meaning your remediation plan, your plan of actions and milestones, a POAM, um, can be non-empty now. You can have remediation uh, activities in there and still contract. But they haven't told us what level they'll accept, what things are acceptable, what are not acceptable. All of that will probably be the significant portion of what will be coming out of the CMMC version two will be this, what is okay to have in your remediation plan and how quickly do you have to have those things? Hey, Fred, Remember, it, yeah. you know, when, when folks think about that, like what, I mean, I, not to guess, but what do you think they're going to say is okay to have in your, in your actions? That uh, look, I, I love speculating, but I'm not speculating on that. I, I don't, I really don't have a clue what that means to say that you can have those actions. Because if you think in the HIPAA world, you can have anything in there as long as you're, you know, committing to addressing those issues in a remediation action plan. But, you know, I, this is probably more like, hey, you can have this, but you can't have this in your plan uh, to be able to move forward. So, you know, that this is this is kind of one of the big wild cards but what is, what is the most important kind of thing to think about? CMMC, the new version, level two, is identical, at least that's what they're saying, to NIST 800-171. Or if you want to really see the requirements, 171A, that particular part of the rule um, or the, the standard is where you would go and look and here's the, here's the equivalent list you would look at of things to say, here's what I need to comply with. So... What's, what's ironic about this, and I, I always try to stress this, well, it's been law since 2018 that anyone that contracts with the DOD has to enter their attestation in the portal that they're compliant or, or they put their scorecard up showing that they're not compliant with this. So in reality, everybody should have been uh, trying to become compliant with NIST 800-171 since 2018. So what has changed? Well, nothing's really changed. The law still says the same thing as it's always said since 2018, because that's the only thing that's been fully promulgated and made into law was the DFARS regulation, right? CMMC has never, ever gotten to a point where it was actually being implemented and required for contracting. So what has changed? Nothing has changed. What does change for you as somebody that's that's has to comply is your time frame, right? And and the kind of how you go about doing it. So it has removed some of the urgency in the sense of, wow, I need to have this in place, and I can't even get on a C3PO's list, their backlog, which was years long. Um, all that 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 urgency of there's no way I can make it on time has gone away. But that doesn't mean that, again, that you haven't always had to be compliant with this 800 If you have a breach and you're not, they're going to come out and audit you and find out, and you're going to be in uh, a whole world of hurt. And you do eventually need to get there anyways. Even if you're not there today, you have to have a plan to get there. None of this stuff is easy. I would say if you're on your way, keep moving towards that goal. There's no reason to throw up. Uh, all your work and say, good, that's over with. And, you know, let's put that behind us. Next slide. Please. Yeah, let me just quickly pivot on one thing Fred said, because this is an important uh, topic and it, and it extends outside DOD contractors and, it, and it's really for everybody because the, the, the time we live in now is the show your papers cyber economy. Everybody's got to demonstrate to everybody. Everybody has a third party risk management program there. I have to assess a bunch of companies myself here, uh, probably before I close a business and request documents and stuff. But if you have attempted to align yourself with a standard of practice, a framework, a regulatory uh, set, and you've assessed yourself and you have uh, your gaps, right, as a corrective action plan or a plan of actions and milestones, that's good enough. That is good enough. He said, we have assessed, we know our problems, we've budgeted them out, we're working on them, here's, you know, our, our the milestones we're gonna hit. Very important that that piece of paper 
that's almost a get out of jail free card. And, you know, a couple of questions in the chat here before we go to the next slide, Fred. You know, one is, you know, what, we cover the CUI versus FCI data types. Yeah. So um, CUI is uh, controlled and classified information. By regulation, it should be marked with a whole set at the top and bottom in the headers with a set of codes that describes exactly what kind of information it is, how it's controlled, um, what it means, who's allowed to kind of see it. That all should be there. What's the reality? Rarely does the government actually send out stuff that has it properly marked because there's all sorts of data going in and out and it doesn't get marked appropriately. But in theory, you should be protecting CUI from any sorts of disclosures, attacks, all the things you would expect. You, know, you need that kind of sensitive information to be protected from. FCI, on the other hand, is federal contract information. The people that tend to deal with that as a, that's all I have is FCI, are people that have a published price list. You buy this bolt, anybody can buy it for, you know, 50 cents a bolt, um, and the government orders off a price list that's public. Well, yes, you're doing business with the government. That's a contract. That's FCI. That's level one. That's the what they call the basic level of cyber hygiene. Um, but if you have CUI, you need to get to level two in the new world. And that is the things that are sensitive, like a specification. Not only is it about the bolt, it's you will build us a bolt with this steel, with this pitch on the on the uh, threads, with this size, with this shape, right? That's that's when it becomes CUI because it's a government led specification. Right. It's a secret. And then, yeah, it's a secret. Uh, and then Marcy. Uh, yeah, I agree says, with Marcy. I think level two also has to be a third party assessment. You, it's only so, level one so, that you can so self assess. Isn't that so right? Let me, right? Just, no, let me no, just read it no, for no. people who's not seeing the comment, no, which not is true. It's it's only level three in the new CMMC 2.0 will require a C3 PAO. Mm. Um, so they've they, anybody so everybody the vast majority the hundred thousand that I believe was mentioned the other day by the head of DHS hundred thousand small businesses that do business with uh, DOD um, most of almost all of those are level threes. There may be 500 of those that are going to need to go to level, excuse me, level three today, level two tomorrow. Um, and the, there's only about 500 that are level five before and level three. Yeah, the now. Raytheons of the world. Right, the mm -hmm. Raytheons, the Lockheed. So if you're the vast majority of people that before needed to be certified no longer need to do it uh, or need to hire somebody, they can self-assess. But when I get to another slide, I'm going to tell you, as Mike alluded to, about what it means to self-assess, because this maybe not what some people think. So why is this why is this happening? And uh, Michael, uh, I, he kind of alluded to it. I wanted to dig in even a little bit more, but it's it was the politics uh, mm -hmm. that kind of rolled into this. It was the accreditation body. Uh, you know, it was very insular. I mean, they did not take a lot of input from outside that body on. How should this have been built, right? Who can, who, what does it mean for that 100,000 suppliers to meet the requirements of this? They were people coming from Fortune 500, Big Five, you know, accounting firms that deal with people with, you know, $100 million budgets for protection instead of, you know, a couple, you know, 100,000 at best, right? Um, there was next to impossible to get on a, a backlog for somebody to actually come out and do this. And most people were looking at a year, a year out in the backlog. So even if you did get to the point where you felt you were ready for certification, it, it was still, you couldn't get, the line was too long, right? You were already missing deadlines. Um, and it was difficult to become a C3 PAO. Um, they had a lot of requirements. One of the reasons, Mike, you, know, you mentioned, um, they, there were some very obscure ISO certifications that you would never expect in anything but a pure auditing company, um, as opposed to people that do the type of work we do that helps people get ready, as well as um, you know understands their gaps and uh, builds the SSPs, the System Security Plan, and the POANs. Um, so, it, it, in a lot of ways, the government kind of put the cart before the horse. I don't think it was. Uh, I don't think there was anything really 
malicious or um, or that people were taking advantage of the program. Mm, I have an opinion there. All right. Time for Mike. You can jump in here. And so, so, I mean, the, the history of this accreditation body is um, spotty. Um, I remember getting interviewed a couple of years ago about this when there was this intrigue going on because uh, there were accusations by some of the board. So first of all, the accreditation body is a nonprofit that was started in Maryland, okay? What that tells you right there is there's a whole bunch of people that had the word cyber somewhere in their job title of their government job that decided to go out and start a nonprofit and figure out how to make money off cyber, all right? And I know I'm cynical about this, but <clears throat> it is what it is. Um, and right, they were paid by by developing this standard somewhat in a vacuum. There wasn't a lot of private sector input. And in fact, there wasn't a lot of DOD input except for the idea. And they came up with this, you know, five-tier maturity model. Maturity models have always existed. Uh, uh, Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon invented it. We've all been doing it for a long time. But we needed this new one now. And so they started making money getting this rush of these auditing organizations that wanted to add this to their portfolio. And somewhere just in the first year, there were accusations that one of the board members prior to uh, initiating this activity started a company that was specifically to make money as one of the accredited assessors to do the certification. So there was this conflict of interest and it looked really bad and they had to work that all out. And, you know, during this time, and it is a good idea. It is a good idea to use a market force and say, if you want our big fat pile of money, you got to be this secure to do business with us. And this is just going to be the way of the future. Um, another topic, but insurance companies are going to be the ones that drive that. Um, but we've landed where we've landed. And eventually, and this happened about eight months ago, I guess, um, uh, Congress and the DOD said, we're going to do a review of this. Well, apparently, we now have the results of the review. <laughs> and they say, no, um, we don't like the way that this has been set up. I am surprised that they are being so liberal with self-assessment because self-assessment, again, is always aspirational. It's very difficult to you know, use that as a source of truth unless it's audited, which is one of the reasons why auditors are in high demand right now. Well, think about what this did to all of those, you know, uh, uh, C3 PAOs. Now that they just, they spent a lot of money. There's two years before they can, you know, get this work as it was originally defined. All their quarterly forecasts just went off a cliff to the extent that they were, you know, basing a lot of that on this kind of activity. And there's a lot of really ticked off people. One of the reasons that Congress called for a review of the program is because the private sector howled about this, right? This unfunded mandate, this is really expensive. I don't make enough off the federal government to meet these requirements. So I'm just not gonna do business with you anymore. And, you know, Congress hears it when people howl. So that, you know, that started this chain of events that got us where we are today. Okay, next slide, Jake. I, and while you're switching, I, I think one of the things I always like to mention, one of the things that was uh, part of the, the news release was as they're going to implement version two, they're actually removing uh, measurements of maturity. That's not something that you're going to be measuring anymore. So something called the cybersecurity maturity model certification no longer has maturity as part of what you're doing. That's kind of one of those ironic, how did that happen twists? So where do we go? Where do we go from here? You Carnegie know, Mellon sued him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's back to the future. Um, there's no more formal oversight of the vast majority, as Mike alludes to. Uh, it's back on everyone's own shoulders, which is where we were. Uh, where we are today. I mean, you're supposed to attest today whenever you, you know, put your bid into the supplier portal that you're compliant. So what has changed? Yeah, well, not really much of anything. Again, um, the fact is people are only more aware now than they were before of their requirements. That's the only thing that really has changed. 
Um, level three in the new world, by the way, the top secrets, the people doing, you know, missile work and high end defense uh, stuff. Um, they will not know what their requirements are until the rulemaking is finalized. For, so for them, they know it's going to be NIST 800-171. They've been told uh, there's a companion called NIST 800-172 that they will be pulling some requirements from. And the, some requirements, we don't know which ones, it's got the hundreds as well. And they'll pick some of those and they'll throw those on top and that will ultimately become level five, and they will need those C3 PAOs to actually come in and certify them. So what about everybody else, right? Same as it ever was. The same requirements that are in place that have always been in place since 2018. In fact, it was 2015 when these requirements were first published and everybody knew this is where you had to go, right? So six, we're six years in from when these uh, standards were first published. Um, Self-assessment does not mean, in almost most cases, to do it yourself. Get, get an outside set of eyes, people that are frankly relatively used to looking at these kinds of systems and the requirements and how you need to validate your compliance. In other words, production of artifacts. What does it mean to produce artifacts to prove to an auditor when you're being certified that you are in fact compliant with the standard? So, there's a lot that a lot of you may not consider unless you've been through a whole series of audits and are familiar with what the auditors will ask you for. So get help, get, get, a, get a second set of eyes, get somebody that understands what the process will be like that you actually have to go through. You still need your system security plan. That hasn't changed. So if you've been working on, um, you know, your CMMC one compliance, everything's don't, everything stays right. Your system security plan stays. Your plan of action and milestones actually doesn't have to be empty now. So most people are like, why do I build one if I know it, I can't submit it if it's empty? Well, now you can, and now you have a reason actually to take time and put effort into your plan. Um, level two, uh, again, it will be an annual self-assessment. For people at the highest level, level three, it's triennial. So they're only doing it because they're at actually being certified once every three years. Level two, level one, everybody pretty much will have to do an annual self-assessment and re-upload this information with an attestation by a senior officer of the company. So again, I, I wanna I want to get across to people that you are taking on liability if you are not compliant and you're trying to contract with the DOD. So that, that's always been the case, and it's going to become even more stringent because they have a neck to grab and choke if, in fact, uh, somebody is found not to be compliant. So if you've been working towards level you know, or version one, almost everything you've done will still be totally valid. You only have a 21 additional controls that you would have done above and beyond what you need to do today. If in fact you have those 21 controls, more power to you. They're all good, they're all important, right? So you haven't really wasted anything. Um, you're just basically kind of repackaging what you've already done into a format that talks to one at NIST 800-171 as opposed to CMMC, either V1 or V2. Um, and as uh, Mike was talking about, you know, there's a backlash building here. Um, you know, is this a precedent that says, you know what? I mean, most of us will agree De Department of Defense sensitive data is probably some of the most important data we have to protect. Probably more important maybe than PII in a lot of cases. Um, so what does this mean if we're saying now that uh, this, our most sensitive data really doesn't need to have a, a level of rigor that gives the government the level of assurance they probably need to protect this data, right? Uh, we know, in fact, that if people are doing self-assessments, there will be people that will not do, uh, do it with the rigor they should. They're going to get breached, and there will be consequences from those breaches. So there's a, a backlash because this sets a major tone in terms of compliance, government, enforcement. What does it mean to actually be 
you know, be certified for something? What does it mean to self-assess for something? And and so, but, you know, Fred, where do you see that backlash going? I mean, it certainly, you know, I was not the only one who noticed that the same day DOD said, oh, okay, let's scrap CM, CMMC1 and go to CMMC2, that, that a contractor announced a breach. The breach had happened earlier, but the, those two things happened on the same day. And so, you know, does the backlash look like, a week from now, a month from now, there's going to be, you know, something big that changes this again. What, like what define Well, let, let, me, let me take that real quick because uh, Jens is doing a back channel with me here in email. And um, I think the appropriate question is, is this really going to do the job we want it to do, which is prevent Chinese, North Koreans, et cetera, from stealing our technology, right? And not all of that is you know, top secret technology. We know that the Chinese are flying a plane that looks fantastically like an F-35 because it really is. Thanks, Lockheed. Um, but uh, he was, he made another example of the rivet pattern in some of our rockets. And, you know, all of a sudden the North Koreans got that right after not getting it right for a long time. Okay, well, so rivet pattern. Is that top secret? Uh, probably not. Is that, you know controlled unclassified that probably is so the question is is the program here going to stop the hemorrhaging of our defense secrets and i'm not sure it is yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna say another there's a, there's multiple backlashes one of them is i know a lar a lot of large companies have taken their CMMC work, which way they were frantically working on, and it just ended. It just full stop. It was like company wide full stop on this work, right? We got other things to worry about now. Well, I don't think that was a good thing for these uh, for these significant, you know, defense contractors that have said, "Whoo, glad that's over with. Let's just take a yeah. big break." I, I don't think that's good for us. Yeah. Well, so self self assessments aren't going to fix that. No, I, you know, in terms of backlash, I think the real backlash is going to come from, um, you know, the private sector auditing firms that are, you know, pissed. <laughs> they spent a lot of money on this thing, you know, forecast, you know, business results, and now they got nothing. Okay, but but you know, so but I'm listening to you guys and and. And Mike, your point, and then Vern's point, you know, in the chat here, if the objective is to keep the Chinese out, this program won't accomplish that objective. Like, is the backlash, like somebody realizes we really screwed up here and we actually do need these controls. So, you know, does CMMC 3.0 come out in a quarter from now? Like when somebody says no, like we really do need something. We are and talking about the U.S. government here. So my money's on. Yeah. I, yeah, but I, when? I, I think that would be me. I think there would be a. I don't think that would fly. They got to get it right this time. I don't think. I don't think they're going to force self assessment onto the small to medium defense contractors. I, I think that is so politically unpalatable. Yeah. Because there, there were, I mean, especially, I believe it was, believe it was in particular, upstate New York um, has a lot of old, entrenched uh, defense contractors, small. Small shops providing, you know, tool and machining, yeah, machining, and they were getting crushed. And you know, some very powerful senators were flat Not out saying, it. "This is this is killing our business. We cannot do this." Right, and and legitimate. I mean, you know, again, you know, running people through a very expensive assessment process. <laughs> is probably going to be prohibitive for the small to medium sized defense contractors forever. It's got to be something not as expensive as it takes to go through that official certification process. We know why. We know why the C-3PO's just paid a ton of money and they have to get that money back somehow. And I get it. It's not like those costs are coming out of nowhere and we're being cheated. But you know, it probably should be opened opened up to any reputable company that, you know, does assessments should probably be capable of doing this kind of work to help uh, the, the 
the lower level. See, I see. I agree with that a hundred percent. And the the problem is not in the standard or the idea or the process or anything like that. The problem has been this accreditation body that set up this scam. I'll say it right. And we we realize that we need to apply some, you know, oversight to defense contractors, and there needs to be standards and there needs to be levels, but. You know, this whole accredited auditor thing and the ex really expensive process doesn't have to be that way, right? I mean, you can, we assess companies all the time against all kinds of standards. It's fairly straightforward. So, you know, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're right. When they get through this rulemaking process, I think there's going to be significant more flexibility and they're going to lose this connection to this accreditation body and that stuff may fall off except for the Raytheons of the world. That's only, that's the only place it's going to apply. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when you, you know, Fred, when you say 21 fewer, you know, controls, like that seems like a bad thing. When you're He actually said 21 it. less, which was bad grammar. I'm glad you caught that. Yeah. yeah also, I, Mike, I don't think we can call it a scam. So no. okay. there you go. There's your, there's your, there's, there's your moderating. Okay. Um, but you know, so uh, Vin says in the chat, yeah, but I don't want to give access to an auditor to snoop around our data, data privacy concern. I mean, you, you, here's, here's the thing. You got to trust somebody. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, you can try to, you know, you can try to go solo. You're able to now. I mean, with self-assessment, you can totally go solo. But again, also auditors don't need access right to your data. data. They need they need your practices, processes. Right. You know, exactly. the, the way that you handle security with a very defined set of questions they're going to ask, and you know, artifacts they're going to seek. Yeah, and, and and you know that's and so again, Rob, that's and Rob was talking about that's what he meant the artifacts because he just went through this process has this big book of stuff ready to show the uh, you know the the certification assessors. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's really what you have to do is you have to build your repository. It's got your SSP, it's got your POAM, it's got all the artifacts that you can produce immediately. In other words, your policies, your processes your network maps, all the things that have to be there, you have to hand to your auditor. Those should be there all the time in this repository. There will be things that they ask for. They'll have you prove that this particular change control ticket is tied to an actual change and a log on a system will show that change and you have to reach in on that day and pull that log out. But the things that don't change, like the policies, you know, the, the network map, it does change, but you should refresh it every time it does, right? Those things should be in there all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Mike, earlier you talked a little bit about the winners and the losers here. You know, clearly, you know, the losers are the firms that, you know, got ready to assess this. But, you know, there is a question here about politics and what happens and who is the most powerful. So, you know, of the winner. So who are the winners and the losers and which one ends up getting the power here? Because right now it looks like the, the small contractors are the ones that won. You're muted, I think. Whoops, keep sitting on my button. You know, I think it's the foot draggers or the winners here. I, and I hate to say that because the 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 big bill they were looking at. So so like Rob, Rob's ready to go to engage the certification body here and now doesn't have to, but knows that Skookum, his business, is in great shape. That's a winner from this. Okay. Um, so, you know, still, I don't know what kind of bearing that's going to have on, on, on bids um, that, uh, you know, you may be denied access to. And I, I don't think that's going to happen until this rulemaking process goes through. Um, you know, the other winners are all the level one companies that are to be go, oh, God, oh, thank God. You know, and, and to me, um, you know, I've, I've had uh, other audit experiences that were structured in just this way. You don't engage a third party until you just get so big um, that your work needs to be checked. And frankly, in other areas, and maybe we'll talk about it later, but other areas that work just fine. Yeah, I mean, Fred, do you, uh, uh, do you agree? Winners and losers? Do you think he's right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fair statement. Um, I think overall, we're probably all a little worse off from this whole experience. It, 
you know, I'm going to be honest. I don't know anybody that ever felt really comfortable with this, even from day one. Mm -hmm. Um, People on our side of the fence, the clients we talk to, it it has been an uneasy, you know, an uneasy process. And I, I think, you know, we're coming out the other side of this with less answers than we fewer. need. Yeah, fewer. Yeah, few. Thank you. <laughs> we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a less fewer yeah. thing later I'm today. To yep. Yep. We, um, we we could do this because there's probably uh, uh, five folks here in the chat that Fred Fred and I have worked with as consultants, and so, um, you know they know we do this. So. <laughs> So, Mike, you know, think, but thinking about this, you know, is this, and you, and you just alluded to this a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, is CMMC 2.0, you know, it looks like the PCI data security standard, right? Yeah, is well, that's analogy? actually what I, that's actually what I was talking about. So, and that works well. If you are a level three or a level four merchant, you self assess and you submit your paper and, you know, and it, and it, and it's called a SAQ, a self assessment questionnaire. And it's perfectly fine. And w- what's at risk here is a cardholder data, which is the thing that's stolen more than anything else. Um, it doesn't have national security implications, but it is stolen a lot. And then if you move up into level two, and I forget what the numbers are, I think level one is you have to be doing 6 million, I think it's 2 million credit card transactions, 3 million. Uh, anyway, you get up to those higher levels, and then it's you have to bring in an accredited body to do a report of compliance for you. PCI is laid out exactly the same way, and I think that's what this accreditation body looked at in part um, as their model for this, or at least DOD when they ripped the guts out of it and said, no, we're going to do it this way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I got to get to one more thing here and then we'll do final thoughts. Um, we right. Said Cause we you got to go 45 minutes. Yeah. Well, I do have to go. I have a plane to catch. It's very bizarre, but I'm in Mexico. That's a long story. If anybody wants to hear it, email me Jake at critical insight.com, which is up there. Um, so uh, quickly, you know, these are all the things we do uh, for companies. If you want to see this and zoom in on it, go to our website, critical insight.com. Um, and, uh, obviously, we help folks. Well, we certainly helped folks get to CMMC 1.0, and we can help folks with CMMC 2.0. Um, the other thing I want to mention is Mike and I do cybersecurity awareness training. Uh, every mostly Mike. Friday. That's mostly me. Yeah. Um, but it's not. It's never boring. Um, and you can invite all your folks. Uh, if yeah. you need a link to it, just email me, Jake at criticalinsight.com. I'll kick you a link. Tomorrow or you can sign up on our website. Um, and then on December uh, 1st, we're going to do a webinar with our friends at Blue Origin um, where cyber and physical security meet. And then on December 7th, vulnerabilities and cyber attacks in Microsoft Azure, uh, because our head of pen testing has found some interesting stuff there. Um, so again, you can sign up on our website or shoot me an email. Uh, and we'd love to have you for any of that. All right, guys, final thoughts. Uh, let's start with Fred. Fred, final thoughts. It's a, it's all about NIST 800 Always has been. Will continue to be. Focus on that. You'll be fine. My final thought is we're going to stop talking about this for two years. <laughs> you think? Yeah. Um, oh, hey, I forgot one thing, which is there is a survey, um, and I need to get the link for it here. Uh, or Ginny, can you put it in the chat? Uh, because it's not coming up here for me. Um, but uh, at the end of all of our uh, webinars, we do give a survey. Here you go. Here's the survey. Got the link now. Um, it's in the chat there, and we really appreciate you joining. We really do want your opinion in the chat. So a couple of things about the survey. Number one is if you fill it out, you can either get a gift card or donate your gift card. Number two, these webinars, believe it or not, get better over time uh, with your feedback. And we love to get your feedback. You can always complain about my language. It's, it's, and you it's can fine. complain. You can com- also or tell. Yeah, or so, yeah. <laughs> it's actually grammar. <laughs> <laughs> All of that. All right. So everybody, please take survey. We really appreciate it. Mike, thanks for the time. Fred, thanks for the time. Everybody, thank you for joining. Yep. And have an awesome day. Yep. And yes, and as yes, and Fred, your language is getting more better. Well done. Travel safe, amigo. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.